Hello, everyone. Welcome to freepilotgroundschool.ca. This is our first kind of real lesson or preparatory ground instruction. We're going to be discussing aircraft familiarization. Uh, in this lesson, there's quite a bit of information. And uh, in reality, your instructor will most likely uh, divide this lesson up uh, kind of into bite-sized chunks and do a little bit uh, every lesson uh, for, you know, let's say the next four flights or so. Uh, this lesson discusses what we need to do uh, with the aircraft uh, getting it ready for flight. Uh, so to get started, we have to uh, cover this, some of the parts of an aircraft. Hopefully you're familiar with most of the parts of an aircraft already. Here's a diagram. I'm not going to read off where everything is. You can figure that out uh, just by looking at this, looking online, and then if you're uh, still a bit confused, you can discuss it with your uh, flight instructor. You'll notice a bunch of instruments in the aircraft's instrument panel. These are arranged in what are, is called the six pack. You'll notice it's uh, six instruments, you know, three by two. Pretty much in all aircraft, uh, modern aircraft, the layout is pretty much the same. On the left, top left, we have an airspeed indicator that tells us our speed through the air. In the middle, we have an attitude indicator, also sometimes called an artificial horizon. We use this when flying in clouds and uh, it, it tells us our attitude. Top right, we have an altimeter, uh, which tells us our height above sea level. That's important, it's not above the ground, it's above sea level. Bottom left is a turn coordinator. We'll learn more about that in our ground school. And it just tells us if we're turning left or right and whether our turn is coordinated. In the uh, bottom middle, we have a heading indicator or directional gyro. Uh, we set this to the compass and uh, it gives us our magnetic heading and uh, but does need to be set regularly. Uh, the advantage to it is it does not have the errors that are associated with the compass. Bottom right is a vertical speed indicator. That's how much we're climbing or descending in, in a minute. It's given in feet uh, per minute. As we prepare for flight, we want to ensure that we have all our documents on board. We use an acronym called AeroGIP to remember what documents we need. That stands for Certificate of Airworthiness. Certificate of Registration, the Pilot Operating Handbook, Weight and Balance, Journey Log, Insurance, and Pilot License. I'll go through these quickly now. It's also covered in your ground school. First off, let's look at the Certificate of Airworthiness. Uh, in this case, the, do the uh, document that I have is a special Certificate of Airworthiness that's issued to amateur built or home built aircraft. Re uh, normal Certificate of Airworthiness is uh, just say Certificate of Airworthiness at the time. What the Certificate of Airworthiness means is that when the aircraft was manufactured, it met the standards of airworthiness. The Certificate of Airworthiness can be invalidated if you no longer meet those, uh, those standards of airworthiness. So for example, if there is outstanding maintenance that's done, uh, there's something broken on the aircraft, that invalidates the Certificate of Airworthiness. Obviously, it has to be on board and it has to be in force in order to be valid. Here is an example of a certificate of registration. The certificate of registration is the certificate that indicates to whom the aircraft is registered to. Uh, contrary to popular belief, the certificate of registration does not say who owns the aircraft because a individual could be leasing the aircraft from somebody else and then it would be the individual who leased the aircraft on the certificate of registration, even though uh, the leaser, the lessor, uh, actually owns the aircraft. So what establishes title to the aircraft is a chain of bills of sale. It's kind of a legal concept, so we won't uh, go into that, but it is important to know that when you buy an aircraft, uh, for example, just because somebody has a certificate of airworthiness doesn't mean they actually own it. You would wanna make sure that there's a bill of sale uh, that indicates that they bought that aircraft from somebody else and they are the legal owner of it and are entitled to sell that aircraft to you. Next, we'll talk about the Pilot Operating Handbook. And you'll go into the Pilot Operating Handbook at length with your instructor. It contains numerous uh, sections, all of which are very important. We'll discuss uh, limitations, such as the maximum gross weight, the normal procedures, emergency procedures, a systems description, 
weight and balance information, and so on. As you work your way through your pilot training, you will be spending a lot of time getting to know your aircraft in the pilot operating handbook. Generally speaking, you will have to have a journey log on board. A journey log documents all the flights that the aircraft has taken. However, if you're at a flying school, the flying school may elect to have that journey log uh, left behind at the office. And uh, that is okay as long as it's filled out at the conclusion of the flight. And in some flying schools, the way they do it is you just fill out a, uh, a daily flight record. And then at the end of the day, all of the flights for that aircraft are all entered in aggregate and total into the journey logbook. When you're looking at the journey logbook prior to flight, you have to make sure that the aircraft has had the required uh, maintenance and inspections. Now, generally speaking, this is the responsibility of the aircraft owner. So if you're at a flying school, uh, they will not let you fly their aircraft unless the maintenance is current. But it is still your responsibility to figure out as a pilot whether uh, the aircraft is uh, current. So you can look up in CAR 625, Appendix B and C, all the requirements. Or if you're at a flying school, you would have to take a look at the uh, maintenance schedule that's been approved by Transport Canada. So here's just an e example of a maintenance log. If you look at the bottom right, or sorry, the bottom, you can see there it says 200 hour inspection due for completion. And then it says that the 200 hour inspection has been completed. So if that's the last maintenance uh, record and the aircraft's flown more than 200 hours, well, obviously uh, the aircraft is no longer current. It's also other requirements such as swinging the compass, doing a tachometer check, a pedostatic check. Uh, every two years you can take a look at it. Maybe I'll just throw this in. You don't need to know this. So if you want to just skip to the next section, you can feel free to do that. But I get a lot of uh, questions from friends and student pilots that are interested in buying their own airplane. And they say, what should I be looking for when I buy an airplane? I have absolutely no idea. Well, here's what it is. The first thing you're going to do is you are going to look at the logbooks, either the technical logbook at the, or the journey logbook. And you are going to look at how this logbook was completed and the sort of maintenance that was done on the aircraft. If you have complete logs, and here's an example of one, uh, whenever an inspection is done, invariably the AME will find snags on the, on the aircraft, things that are not working. So in this case, we can look, it has a 200 hour inspection and oh, look what they found. They found that the taxi light right here, taxi light is unserviceable. And what did they do? They removed the bulb, found that the bulb was unserviceable and replaced with a new bulb and tested okay. Uh, there's a few other things. There's a cowl fastener missing and they replaced that with a new cowl fastener. And this is going to happen pretty much all the time. And if you go take a look at an aircraft that you're thinking of buying and, and it looks, the logbook looks something like this. Uh, there's snags, uh, there's inspections, the aircraft maintenance engineer is fixing something. It might mean that, you know, you might have an aircraft that's reasonably well maintained. If you go and want to buy an airplane, you open the logbook and all it says is annual inspection completed, no faults found. And the next year it says annual inspection completed, no faults found. That should be a big red warning flag. And that would be an aircraft that you probably should stay away from because the whole idea of an inspection is that you find things that need to be fixed and, the, and airplanes will always have small things that need to be fixed. And probably what that means if it's no faults found for many years is just a bunch of deferred maintenance uh, that the owner has just said, oh, it's good enough, it's good enough, it's good enough. And finally, it kind of catches up to the owner and then he's facing a $10,000 repair bill. And he says, I better sell this airplane as quick as possible. Now, most aircraft maintenance engineers are really good. They have good integrity. They will look at an aircraft. They will not sign their name to uh, an aircraft that hasn't been properly maintained or that there's uh, airworthiness items that are outstanding. However, there are a few unscrupulous AMEs and they'll, they'll say, okay, I'll, uh, I'll do your annual inspection, it's $500. And they won't actually do anything, they'll just sign the book. And, uh, and when you see a logbook that says annual inspection completed, no faults found, and you see that for a few years, it's a good chance they used an AME that was just charging them a few hundred dollars just for their signature but uh, didn't actually do any work. So there's a big red flag uh, right there.
We also require a certificate of insurance. The insurance has to be valid. You only need liability insurance. You don't need uh, aircraft, uh, what's called in-flight hull insurance, or in a car, we'd call that comprehensive insurance. Uh, but you do, it does need to be valid. Uh, it's worth noting that aircraft insurance is actually quite a bit different than car insurance on a number of different fronts. So first off, in a car insurance, if you have a car, you tell the insurance company, what car you have. You don't have to tell them what it's worth. Uh, they figure that out themselves. And then if you crash your car, they will look at their tables and say, okay, this is what your car is worth. And this is what we're giving you. And there's really nothing you can do about it. An airplane's a bit different. You tell them the, the make and model, and then you also tell them how much you want the aircraft insured for. So you might say, okay, I think this aircraft's worth $40,000. And then they will adjust the uh, premiums accordingly. And if you crash the airplane, the aircraft's damaged, they will decide either to give you the, the full value or the price of repair. And and so that's the big difference or one of the big differences. Uh, of course, they could refuse to give you the full value if they think that you've artificially inflated the value. So this Cessna 150 might be worth $40,000. Well, if I insure for $100,000 and I crash it, they're going to be looking at it saying, wait a minute, something doesn't make sense here. This airplane, there's no way it's worth $100,000 and we're not paying that out. The second thing that's a, a different, a big difference between aircraft insurance and uh, and car insurance is that aircraft insurance will say that the aircraft has to be airworthy and it has to be operated in accordance with the aircraft flight manual or pilot operating handbook. So a car, for example, if you're driving your car and it's really not roadworthy, it's a piece of junk, you haven't maintained it, all of a sudden a wheel falls off, like an axle brake, a wheel falls off and you damage the car, you drive it into a ditch, um, the insurance will generally pay for it. It's, just unfortunately the way it is. But in, a, in an aircraft, if you haven't done the, the required maintenance and it crashes because of that, they're not paying for it. Same thing goes if you exceed limitations. Uh, so let's just say you fly over gross weight and you get in an accident, they might not pay for it. The insurance will say, no, you didn't fly it in accordance with the uh, aircraft flight manual. Whereas in a car, let's say you're pulling a trailer that's too heavy it's highly unlikely that the insurance will refuse payment. Or let's just say you're intoxicated, you're drunk in a car. Well, they're still going to pay out an insurance claim. Uh, let's say you injure somebody while driving drunk. Whereas in an airplane, uh, they might just outright refuse to pay because you're breaking the uh, regulations. So keep that in mind if you happen to be an owner of an aircraft or you're flying an airplane. Let's discuss the flight test standards. There's actually a lot in the flight test guide uh, related to Item two on the flight test, the preparation for flight. So you are going to be expected uh, to show that the documents are valid, for example. So things that I talked about, they will ask you, uh, show me that the aircraft is uh, airworthy. Uh, open, so you open the logbook, you show that there's no deferred defects, you show that the maintenance, the latest maintenance has been done. You can figure out the number of hours remaining before the next service. So you might look at, it says 50 hour inspection, and then you can just, simple subtraction. Uh, it might ask you for limitations. So let's say a light is burnt out and it's a deferred maintenance. Well, you might say, okay, well, I can only fly during the day. Also, you'll be expected to uh, explain the best angle of climb, best rate of climb and maneuvering speeds. You'll have to know those from memory. So uh, you will discuss that a lot more later on in your training. You can also figure out takeoff and landing distances and flight planning things. Again, we'll discuss it more later in your training, but uh, you will, it is evaluated on, uh, on this item in the flight test. You will be expected to uh, complete a weight and balance uh, calculation. And uh, again, we will be discussing this later in your training, even though it's evaluated on uh, this section. So your maximum takeoff weight, uh, the examiner might give you a scenario where you're outside of weight and balance limits, and then you will be expected to figure out how to get into the uh, weight and balance uh, limits. The examiner is going to be uh, expecting you to check your fuel and tell you how long you can fly for with the fuel. Make sure the aircraft is in a safe condition. So doing a, uh, a pre-flight inspection or walk around. You're also going to be expected to give a passenger safety briefing, uh, such as seat belts, doors, emergency locator, transmitter, uh, that sort of thing. You're going to have to follow your checklist, start the aircraft uh, properly, and uh, and to make sure that your your controls are working. Again, 
we'll be discussing that in a later lesson. And lastly, you will be expected on your flight test to uh, explain some systems. So you're going to be looking at your systems in your pilot operating handbook and explaining those. So for example, how the carburetor heat works, the propeller, the electrical system, that sort of thing. So that concludes this preparatory ground instruction on preparation uh, for flight. Uh, you will be spending some time with your instructor going through all these documents over the course of the, your next uh, few flights. And just uh, your instructor will be explaining things to look for. You'll actually get to look at a real journey uh, logbook and, and how that is all set up. So thanks for joining me today and uh, have a good day.